I'm Ted Seides, and this is Capital Allocators. This show is an open exploration of the people and process behind capital allocation. Through conversations with leaders in the money game, we learn how these holders of the keys to the kingdom allocate their time and their capital. You can keep up to date by visiting capitalallocatorspodcast.com. My guest on today's show is Christian Falk, the Chief Investment Officer of Australia's $46 billion construction and building industry superannuation fund, or CBUS. Prior to joining CBUS in 2012, Christian spent 14 years consulting to Australian super funds at Frontier Advisors. Australia's superannuation program mandates that employers contribute 9.5% of its employee salaries into a super fund, which is owned by the employee, like a 401k in the US, and grows with investment returns until retirement. The employees, in turn, have a choice of providers to invest their savings. The model has been one of the most successful in the world in preparing the population for retirement. Our conversation starts with Christian's path to the CIO seat at CBUS and focuses on the hybrid investment model blending internal and external management. We discuss the transition to internal management as asset scale, example of CBUS's internal property company, economics of internal management, talent recruiting and retention, portfolio structure, external manager selection, people management, and investment with a long time horizon. For the next two weeks, you can join the Think Tank Premium Subscription Service at a special Labor Day discount rate. We're experimenting with price elasticity, and if the sticker price alone has held you back, now would be a great time to sign up. Individuals can join at a 50% discount this week and next week only, which will allow them to read the library of transcripts, join episode discussion groups, and access special content. And corporate subscribers have a new perk worth the price of admission alone. Visit CapitalAllocatorsPodcast.com for more details. Please enjoy my conversation with Christian Folk. Christian, thanks so much for joining me. Thank you. It's fun to do this in real time on the other side of the world. Technology is an amazing thing, I guess. Uh, yes. Well, I'm actually a big supporter of that. I'm managing people in multiple offices and trying to promote flexible work. So I'm glad we can make it happen. <laughs> yeah, we'll get to that in a bit. Why don't we get started with your background and how you came to be in the seat that you occupy today? I started my life as an actuary. And for those that don't know what actuaries do, they sort of combine probability, statistics, mathematics with finance modeling. And they use those skills to try and solve financial problems where there's a bit of uncertainty. So typically you'll see them in the defined pensions space, but also in insurance and so forth. So when I was growing up, I um, had a strong interest in maths and economics. And my father was an engineer and I decided I actually didn't want to do what my father did. So <laughs> I was lucky enough to have a scholarship with a local insurance company, National Mutual, which ended up being bought out by AXA and then I think subsequently bought out again. So it was a mutual life office at that time. So the owners were the policy holders at that time. And it was in the early 90s. I spent a little bit of time in their head office which is sort of about strategy and the total business. And I spent some time in the corporate superannuation area and I'd never heard of superannuation. At that stage, that was the very early iteration of, it wasn't quite compulsory super at that stage, but in the late 80s, there was this accord. So it was an agreement between workers and government and effectively through the industrial system, employers, so rather than having high wages inflation, there was an agreement to offset some of the claim for increased salary as contributions into superannuation. Actually, at that stage, you know, one of the biggest industries that drove that was the construction industry. So CBUS had been established a few years earlier as a result of that. And I think that's really an interesting thing to understand is that our superannuation industry in Australia in its current form was formulated 
in the early stages through the industrial system. So because the members actually sacrifice something to get their superannuation, they have a very strong sense of ownership. Anyway, I got a job with National Mutual. It happened to coincide with a downturn in the economy and that sort of left a bit of an impression on me. Uh, luckily, it didn't affect me, but it did affect a few people around me. And what was a trend in those days, and it was a combination of more formalising the superannuation guarantee, which meant that every sort of working Australian who worked above a, a minimum amount of hours was entitled to compulsory superannuation contributions, which started off at 6% and has grown to 9.5% now. But when that was introduced, we had to redesign defined benefit funds. But we also had similar issues, I think, that probably you see today in the States and so forth, you know, potentially either overfunding or underfunding. And most corporates, superannuation was the non-core business. So there was this trend to define benefit funds into accumulation, which you know, was a lot of work for actuaries in the short term, but Ultimately, you don't really need an actuary to run an accumulation or an account-based fund. So I could see that the direction of my chosen career was sort of going on the decline. So I thought, well, I better actually think about what I should specialise in next. So when you're trained as an actuary, you look at both the liabilities and the asset side. So I figured, well, the asset side of it was going to endure. So I then switched to focusing on the investments aspect. And start off as a hybrid job, but at the time, National Mutual, the consulting area had spun out, and I still sort of felt that the model of that business was sort of on the decline. And we'd come across competing funds, these industry funds, and I didn't really know much about it, but I thought, well, there's something about this model because the returns are pretty good and the costs seem a lot cheaper than what we can do, and they seem to have scale. Yeah, I just happened to come across an ad for a company looking for an asset consultant to consult to the industry funds. So I thought, well, this is a growing area. And it asked for knowledge in infrastructure. This was in the early 90s, right? So yeah, investing in infrastructure wasn't a very common thing. Direct property, which I was aware of, and private equity. And again, private equity, didn't really know much about, but I thought, oh, well, I'll give it a go. <laughs> <laughs> I sort of said, well, you know, I know about property, I know about defined benefits, I know about consulting. So I applied for the job. And I said, look, you know, I think the principles could be easily learned, but need a little bit of time to understand the asset class, but I'm willing to give it a go. And I was lucky enough to get the job. So my first consulting role was actually with CBUS. I became the lead consultant for CBUS. And at that time, they were $2 billion. So what year was that when you first started consulting? 1999. It was actually a bit daunting because the independent director that they had for CBUS was the ex-Reserve Bank governor. And in Australia, it's a bit like Canada, our currency moves around quite a bit with the uh, global economy and I'm there expecting to give currency advice to the guy that actually used to run the Reserve Bank of Australia. Yeah. <laughs> the fund itself didn't have at that time internal investment people. And so it was, it was effectively like an outsourced CIO. They had the very early iteration of a direct property company in those days, and they spent a lot of time talking about that. It wasn't in its initial iteration. It wasn't working as well as it should have. So the director spent a lot of time on that, which meant that when it came to all the other issues, effectively, if I could get agreement with Bernie Fraser, then most of the stuff got through. So yeah, not so bad. <laughs> it was a great learning time then we had early discussions around thinking about responsible investing so you got to remember that these funds are comprised of both employers and unions right and they need two-thirds agreement to make anything happen so in the early days talking about voting on companies was potentially controversial they addressed it by setting up a sort of an external company that would give advice based on principles and policies to guide us around how you engage with companies. It's effectively a 401k and you're the consultant, Bernie's at the head, there's a property company and who was thinking about the assets and how it was set up? Well, effectively that was 
me as the advisor. So, and again, in those early days, you know, if we wanted to change a manager, we had to do a beauty parade. Yeah. <laughs> but again, it was like, as long as I agreed and Bernie agreed, others at that time were willing to take that advice. And clearly, as the fund has grown, it operates very differently uh, nowadays. But I suspect there's probably a lot of pension funds around that still have that sort of dynamic between the board and the advisors. And, and so how long did you spend advising CBUS? So I was with Frontier until, actually until I got asked to join CBUS, which was in late 2012. And that came about, we had the global financial crisis, which was, again, a really fascinating time. Uh, those sort of experiences burn in your mind. <laughs> yeah. And it helps sort of inform the way you think about the world going forward as well. Post that period, I think the fund had decided, and also coincided with Bernie retiring off the fund, that it needed to think about how it structured itself as it grew. And you've got Towers Watson to come in alongside with Frontier <laughs> and talk about the new model. And we pretty much said you're going to need to increase resourcing. So they already had an internal team, but it was more focused on the operational side of things. And they said, look, you know, you need to have people inside that helps own the strategy rather than just relying on the asset consultant. But I did get asked to consider the role. I thought about it. And one of the things I thought about is, well, you know, there was a strong commitment from the board around really lifting the internal capability. And I looked at the resources around the fund. It had built a projects team, a strong people and culture area. And uh, coming from a relatively smallish consulting firm, which didn't have the money to spend on dedicated people and culture type people, and I was the deputy managing director at the time, I could see and appreciate the value of having these sort of other resources at your disposal. Plus also that I knew that there was a lot of potential to cut fees in the fund. And so I thought, well, actually, I could probably do quite a lot. How big was CBUS when you joined? This is all in Australian dollars, so yeah. you know, get your calculators out. And if you want it in US dollars, it's three quarters of that at the moment. So I think it was about $20 billion. Okay, so it had gone from 2 to 20 in those 13 to 14 years. What was the strategy in place when you showed up? It was still external management. It was building internal capability to better manage the managers and also a more dedicated capability around thinking about asset allocation, but still highly dependent on Frontier at the time. We also were quite deliberate about building out systems to better understand the portfolio. We introduced MSCI Barra as, as a risk system that we incrementally added new data information platforms. We sort of argued that on the basis that it gives us better insights around our own portfolio, which gives us a greater capacity to make informed decisions, far more than could be done from an asset consultant who doesn't have that information. But uh, at the same time, we were also setting down on a path of looking at the managers that we had and actually, we didn't really need to change anything. We just had to go to the managers and say, look, we're resourcing up. We know what your fees are. We need a better deal. And in some cases, it was a good manager, but they had a bit of downside performance, so we're a bit opportunistic. <laughs> and at the same time, there was another major superannuation fund, Australian Super, that had said they were internalising. The combination of going in and reducing fees without having to sort of materially change the strategy Plus adding the platform in terms of information and so forth allowed us each time we went back to the board, we said, look, returns are still strong. You're seeing the benefit in terms of the depth of information coming to you, investment committees, but we've also saved you $15 million per annum. How about taking a little bit of that savings and I've got a few ideas for some extra people in the team. So we did that for about three years and then, we really need to, I think at the time when I started this, we were about $30 billion. So it went from 20 to 30 in three years, or 32. One of the things we were finding was that, I mean, we're getting strong outperformance from our active managers. We were sort of of a size that, and also that internal capability allowed us to pick and move those portfolios around to maximise or to get good alpha. 
But the issue we were finding was that the best managers were closing and some of our best managers actually made so much money that they decided to retire early and give our money back. And we felt, well, this is not sustainable for us. And we did a little bit of projections on what would happen if we had stronger cash flows or one of the managers closed up shop, another one closed up shop. And then we looked at our list of managers that we had lower conviction in. And so we would have ended up having to either add more managers, which meant that we had to pay the same fees scale again. So we were not getting the benefits of scale. Plus our alpha conviction was deteriorating. So we knew that the model wasn't going to sustain. So I had to take a step back and think about, well, how do we want to position ourselves going forward? At the same time, we were doing a little bit of direct investing was made in cash. Our property development company had gone through a few iterations. It's now, at that time, was incredibly successful. So we're, I think, fairly unique, certainly in Australia and probably globally, where we have a dedicated property development company that purchases land, gets the design of a building, gets all the pre-lease tenants, builds a building, and then we hold it. And the portfolio is of the highest quality. We've got long whales. We've got a lot of government tenants, high corporate. Is it all local? It's all in Australia. It's generated really strong returns as well. And the reason being is that we don't have to pay fund managers. We actually know the industry, right? Our stakeholders, both the employers and the unions, they actually know what's going on in the industry. <laughs> so we have a good, strong reputation for delivering and for making sure that people on the work site get paid what they deserve and safety is important. And the quality of the product is there. And one of the things that you need to successfully get a development off the ground is all those pre-commits. So that reputation creates a lot of the value. And the last... So the last five years, it's earned on average over 20% per annum, which is just astounding. So it's a great example that if you understand the industry, you've got people on the ground, you have something distinctive so that you can generate strong returns and also a really high quality product. So that was quite an inspiration for us. So we thought, well, if we're able to do that in property, surely we should have to think about how we could do that across the whole portfolio because that's only 5% of the portfolio. So that sort of helped inspire, well, what do we think we should do going forward? We can't continue to outsource. We have to do something different. How do we ultimately either increase capacity or replace the return stream from the alpha for something else? And so we did work. We talked to a lot of international players, also some of the domestic players that have internalised before. We looked at the academic research and we went through quite a a considered process with the investment committee around, okay, well, what should we do in terms of positioning ourselves over the next three years? It's great to be able to, rather than talk about an annual budget, actually talk about a plan over a three- to five-year period. And in the end, we ended up with a new model, which is a hybrid model. So we think that there's still plenty of managers that we like and can add value that we can't replicate. So those ones still have a place in the portfolio. And are there certain pockets, either asset classes or geographies, where that's more prevalent? So within infrastructure, for instance, we already have a number of managers that are high quality and got global reach, but they're very big. So they can give us access to the really large deals. And in some cases, I'll source them and we might actually invest alongside with them. But because they're so big, there's a whole space of infrastructure that doesn't get addressed, which is sort of the mid-size and also greenfields. So we felt that we could complement that. Plus also sometimes in consortia, certain partners actually have a higher chance of winning than others. So you sort of want to have a little bit of optionality there. So that's an example. But equities is the same. The way we sort of thought about how we add value. So one is focusing on being a long-term investor because we have strong cash flows and a fairly young membership. So we think that thinking about your activities, thinking about the investment over longer time horizons, it's a natural approach for a fund like us and we think that it lends itself to drive value. So as an example with CBUS property, if you thought about investments in the short term, you never do development because there's a, a long lead time to buy you know, a piece of land, get approvals get tenants and you don't really make much return but if you think about it as a pipeline of opportunity 
right? And then you actually can make that model work. Yeah. How does that apply to the public markets? So with public markets, one of the strategies that we have is we call it the global quality strategy. So we look for companies that have a strong business model that we think endures, that has something about the way they do things that creates a moat for disruption. It's not value or growth bias. We have a combination of companies in that way. But again, it comes down to sort of fundamentally, do you want to trade rapidly around companies or do you want to think about picking companies that provide a service that, because if you think about it, ultimately the returns you get are based on the willingness of your customers to pay and keep paying. How many names are in that portfolio? Oh, it's about 40 names. I've only been going for a relatively short period of time, although the performance is actually quite promising. When you take a new initiative like that, how do you initially size it? So we're a, a $45 billion fund now. And we look at the construction of our portfolio and you know, the relative size. So 17% of our international equities portfolio should belong to a manager. But when we first invested, obviously it was new. So we chose not to allocate a full allocation. So we started off with about 400 million, which is actually was enough for us to cover the costs. I mean, this is the a real illustration of why the outsource funds management model is quite challenging for bigger funds because no matter what, particularly if it's market-driven, you pay them more, right? In our case, we have a relatively fixed cost, and if we double the mandate, then we're not paying that much more. So for us, you know, break-even relative to a fund manager was sort of four or $500 million. Uh, they're now managing $1.2 billion, yeah. uh, which is getting close to equal size. And that they are being assessed in the conventional way that we assess a team against other fund managers. We've actually picked a couple of fund managers, a universe that we think have broadly similar strategies. So we want to not just assess them against a benchmark, which we do do like a market benchmark, but also you know, allow for a style and approach that doesn't always generate alpha over all periods. And what's the environment like for hiring that talent internally when, as you mentioned, the competitive environment would indicate they'd get paid a lot more if they were managing it externally? So in Australia, there are a small number of funds that have decided, actually, they do need to think about taking more control on the investment side. So we weren't the first to talk about internalization, but we were sort of a close follower. For us, I think a lot of the people when they come to us, I think they're driven by the fund's you know, sole focus on generating strong risk-adjusted returns to members so they don't have to worry about marketing and multiple investors and so forth. I think the other thing that really attracts people is that I've been quite deliberate in trying to build a team with capabilities across multiple types of investment strategies so that we can sort of think about in totality a, like a total portfolio aspect. So if we have something that doesn't quite fit in one portfolio, there's enough people that whether you've got credit skills or direct investing skills or listed equity skills that you can sort of pull them together and say, well, actually, can we do something with that? And I think that's got some attraction for people. So they're very capable and in their own sphere, but if they see an opportunity that doesn't quite fit into their capabilities, there's still a way to take advantage of that. And I think the other thing that we've been very focused on is sort of cultural fit. Yeah, what does that mean? The way we want to position working with our team is that success is based on not just your own individual effort, but also the way that you work with others. So if people come in and say, okay, look, you know, I don't want to be disturbed just assess me on my individual portfolio outcomes, that just doesn't work. There's a lot of pride in the team about innovating and disrupting and finding the best idea. So there's an alignment there. So it's not about sort of hiding. <laughs> you do need to make a visible contribution, but it's with others. Uh, that focus on the member purpose and really just that true understanding about what you're there for is really important. I think also, I mean, we've been very 
strong in sort of drawing the connection between the money that we have and its impact on the economy and society. And I think for people, they're, they're quite proud of the fact that you know, if they find an investment opportunity that actually you know, either creates jobs or creates some benefit, I think they like that. I like the freedom that that sort of gives rather than just saying, look, I'm only focused on this month's return. And that longer term horizon as well is very important because, again, people feel confident they can take a position and they've got enough time to allow it to play out. So I think it's all those sort of things. So when you roll all this up, what does the asset allocation structure look like for CBUS as the total portfolio? This is interesting because we still have quite a traditional approach around looking at asset classes, yet thinking across those asset classes is going to be a really important contributor to value. So, and it's a bit of a challenge because when you bring people in and you delegated authority to make decisions, so you've got attribution and attribution is um, traditionally based on asset class returns. Yet we feel that either opportunities or even understandings around what could drive a portfolio could be just as well being driven by a thematic or an asset opportunity that just doesn't fit cleanly in one space. So you know, one of the things that we're quite conscious of is there's actually a, a really interesting interplay between, say, property development and infrastructure. There are many examples of infrastructure assets that interface with property. And quite often what you do is you pay an investment bank to actually take those opportunities and to structure it and split it out. And then you go ahead and you buy the individual pieces and put it back together again. <laughs> it's like a yeah. <laughs> but the flip side is, unless you've got an investment bank doing that or you've got some mechanism to think about a portfolio that removes those barriers, then those opportunities don't get pursued. Yeah. So what does it look like at that highest level before you start trying to fill in the cracks? So we have the asset classes, but we also think about defensive and return-seeking type of portfolios. We even think about, from a defensive point of view, about what's the effectiveness of the defensiveness. So, for instance, cash, its cost is it's not really a cost, but it's a low return, but its defensiveness is probably not that strong. Uh, we think about currency in the same way. Uh, we think about options and fixed income also. Same thing around credit. So we sort of look at that and it's based on different scenarios. So we might say, well, what's the sort of scenario that might lead to a downturn? So is it related to the global economic thematics? So, for instance, the US being in the, the late growth cycle at some point in time, there being sort of we get back eventually to some kind of normal economic cycle reduction. What does that mean? How does it sort of flow across all the asset classes? Or in Australia, it might be a housing market, for instance. So, you know, we've had a very strong property and housing market. And what's the impact of different moves that would slow that or create a correction there? And then you sort of got to go and work out, is it based on interest rates rising in response to inflation or do they rise too early? Then you look at, well, which assets are going to be positively in one circumstance. If they're inflation protected, they're probably okay. We use scenario analysis to sort of go through those different things and then we sort of try to look across the portfolio and say, well, which assets are likely to be either positively or negatively affected. Yeah. Those scenarios have to come off of like a neutral portfolio. So before you start running it, how do you figure out what you want that neutral portfolio to be before you start tweaking it because of different scenarios? We used to have a long-term portfolio, but it was sort of like so long that it didn't capture medium-term trends. So now we have a reference portfolio and it's designed to take into account particular sort of aspect of the cycle. So for instance, that we're in a very low interest rate part of the cycle, there's likely to be some interest rate rises at some point in time. So it doesn't form a view about when, but it is sort of in the five-year type horizon. So that is discussed and agreed by the investment committee. And then we've got delegations around that to deviate across. And then the way we think about deviating is based on asset class considerations, but also we're informed by some of these scenarios as well. And is most of the asset class considerations valuation-based? So there's macroeconomic input, there's valuation, 
And that's tricky because so it's both relative to history, but of course I think almost everything seems relatively expensive to history, but it's also relative to each other. And so that sort of gives us a sense of where would you want to be in one or the other. And then the question of how much risk do you want to take is sort of informed by macroeconomic cycles and broader valuation relative to history. So as you look at the $45 billion today, how much of it is being managed internally? So at the moment, it's only just, I think, around 10 to 12% now. There's a number of strategies to be funded. So we have a debt lending strategy, which will, depending on the attractiveness of opportunity is in the pipeline will take a few years to to ramp up we have a small caps team that's come on board that will be allocated money this is in aussie equities there'll be another aussie equity strategy where we take longer term positions in companies sort of hold and try to build broader relationships with them which we think is uh, an interesting one and then we've got a few other strategies around alternative beta that we're doing some work with. So we've got a quant team, but we're looking at working with an external manager where we can take our IP and their IP and combine it. So those things will be implemented this financial year, so in the next 12 months. And that should bring our internal management up to about 20%. We think ultimately over the next three to four years, it'll probably go up to 35 or 40%. Of Let's talk a little bit about the rest of that pool. How do you go about sourcing external managers? It has been in the traditional way. So we have an asset consultant and advisors, but we also have our own internal team and the internal team is probably taking a greater responsibility with that. We probably are increasingly looking at managers that can you do something for with us. So the example of the alternative beta is one of them. And we've compared internally managing or working with a fund manager on this. And actually the proposition from a fund manager competes very well with internal management. So we'll go with the fund manager in that instance because then we'll be able to combine our IP with theirs. So for us, I think it's, it's either they've got something quite unique right? Because we can't do everything and we'll pay for good quality managers or they're willing to work with us in a different way and we think that that's very attractive or if it's a space where we think that we can do it ourselves then we'll do it ourselves. That's the sort of thinking that we've applied. Yeah. How have you tackled private equity in the sort of traditional corporate businesses? (laughs) Yes. So we've have a fund of funds program that was entered into a long time ago and and frankly that just doesn't work for us so we've got a legacy portfolio there that we're just sort of working through in australia it's a small market for high quality private equity managers so you sort of know who's around there and also the advisor sources transactions so that's been the model to date but we've been sort of thinking about as you become more involved in the market new things start to come to you. So we're starting to see direct opportunities coming to us that are not really infrastructure. They're more private equity, but we'd like to hold it longer than a private equity time horizon. So we're we're putting our mind a bit towards that. The other thing that we're sort of thinking about is um, in relation to finding opportunities to invest in the decarbonisation of the um, efficiency sort of space, so playing the thematic. We think there's a big opportunity to look at uh, the construction industry. You know, there's a huge role that can be played around new innovative construction design. We also are aware that there's a, I suppose, a disruption to the industry that's happening through technological change and so forth. So we think we're just playing around with the idea of, well, maybe in the same way that we could use our networks to build a very successful property development company, could we take the same approach and work with other corporations in the industry to support a bit more innovation, which would then mean that we would need to bring in some private equity type skills into the team. So I think if we were to do it, it would be selective and it would be in an area where I think we could demonstrate a competitive advantage. How easy or difficult is it for you to bring in those types of private equity professionals internally when there's so much pride in keeping costs low? 
So for us, I think that the whole concept of internalisation has been sort of interesting because we've had to think about how we pay people differently. We've had the introduction of variable pay to a small number of staff. We keep it fairly modest compared to the industry standards, so the amount of at-risk or opportunity is not what you would sort of see in the typical asset management business, but it's there. So I think that's an important thing. I think people are coming because they get a sense they can really build something unique. So in the early stages, it hasn't been too bad, particularly as we have hired credible people. So when they see people, credible people coming along, it makes it easier. They go, okay, well, clearly they've got all the things around that allow those people to come and do their job. My feeling is that you know, over time, we're going to have to keep looking at remuneration and and adjusting for that. That's the reality. But I think most people are coming in along those lines as well. They come in, establish something, prove themselves. I think also they get satisfaction from other aspects of the job as well. So that's been a pretty important part of it. And I think certainly we've got, I think we've got over 100 Aussie equities managers, for instance. There's just way too many for our market. So the smart people sort of see consolidation is happening. That's 100 that you have relationships with? You're seeing 100 that exist? No, no. In the Australian market, there's like 100 people trying to sell Aussie equities. But I mean, for instance, our, our global team, they actually came from a um, family office, invest in the same strategy. So the time horizon was very similar. But the feedback I got was, well, they sort of got a bit tired making billionaires richer. <laughs> I actually like the idea of making ordinary Australians richer. So, so people sort of moved for those reasons as well. And we've got a lot of money and that they can have the opportunity to invest and it's growing. And we do try to make sure that we, if they need anything, whether it's information, travel to succeed, that we make sure that we don't deny that. So we find that that's all really important. How much of your investments in total are local inside Australia versus outside? So we've got about a quarter of the portfolio, which is Aussie equities. So it's still it's quite a high bias to Aussie equities. So cash, we've got a higher level of cash at the moment. So it's 10% cash. Fixed income would be half and half. It's a smaller level of fixed income at the moment. So it's probably only a couple of percent there. Credit's about half of the credit portfolio is domestic. The other half is international. How much is total in credit? Credit's about 5%. With the capacity to grow, assuming that there's the credit cycle changes around, <laughs> it's always determined by the opportunity set, the price of the risk. The other area is infrastructure. About half of that portfolio is international, half of it's domestic. That's partially because the in Australia, it's actually quite a conducive environment for investors to look at new infrastructure opportunities. Property at the moment is almost all domestic. It's unusual that that's the case because you know, we just have this advantage that we can create products, whereas most pension funds here, the product's constrained, so they have to go overseas. We do have a small allocation overseas, uh, though. So I think, generally speaking, it'd be probably about 40% of the portfolio is still domestically focused. Yeah, um, yeah. But increasingly, it's going to have to be more global as we get bigger. How do you think about... A competitive environment with either other superannuation funds or globally? Yeah, it's interesting because we just had a productivity commission on the whole superannuation industry. So it's a report that was conducted on behalf of the government to look at it. And I think it's fair to sort of take a step back. And they did some analysis around the different parts of the industry. So the main parts are industry funds, which is like us. So they're set up as mutuals pretty much. So we don't have to make a profit for our shareholders. We just, it's cost recovery or profits returns go to the members. And there's the retail funds, which are owned by banks. They do need to make a profit on the way, but they're very big too, or some of them are quite big. They've got you know, strong distributions through the banking network. And then there's uh, what we call small self-managed super funds, which you know, people with larger balances, you know, the accountants will say, well, you can stop your own fund to do it yourself. The report pretty much said that the larger funds were the ones that were delivering and they did custom benchmarks for their strategies so it wasn't distorted too much by the risk of return. 
positioning. But the broad conclusion was the bigger funds generally and the industry funds generally outperformed. The smaller funds didn't generally. And for the self-managed funds, unless you had more than a quarter of a million, then you seriously underperformed. Fortunately for us, we've delivered very strong returns over quite a long period of time. So CBUS Property not only has generated those returns, but in the last I think eight years, it's created 70,000 jobs in our own industry, which is a really interesting, it's this virtuous circle because we take our members' superannuation money and then a portion of it goes back to creating assets that will generate returns for their retirement, but at the same time generates new jobs for them which then generates contributions. So. And how do you think about when you're analyzing a particular project, whether it's a property project or a private equity business, direct private equity business, how do you add up that math of, <laughs> is it just the investment return on the asset or do you also incorporate, oh, if we employ this many people and then they return this much in contribution, that that's part of the expected return? First and foremost, it is return and risk. But we think that you don't have to compromise. It's really interesting. I was in the States actually last week with a lot of pension funds. And when you talk about either impact or the SDGs, for instance, which is all about looking at money, but sort of looking at societal needs as well. There's a view that automatically that there's a compromise, but actually we believe that particularly if you remove a lot of the intermediaries in between, you can get closer to the opportunity. You don't have to have that compromise. So we're driven first and foremost by the return and the risk, but we are increasingly looking at measuring other impacts of our investment decisions. So before it was primarily the environmental outcomes of our property development and the jobs that are created but the sustainable development goals allow us to look at and think about that sort of framework across the broader part of the portfolio when we look at opportunities. I think one of the things that's very unique about the Australian system is that although I talked about through the industrial process, you can decide which fund uh, contributions will go through by default if you don't actively choose, People can always leave you, right? They can choose. So it's a contestable system, but with an underpinning that gives you the capacity to think a bit longer term. So that's quite an interesting mix because you've got enough assurance that you've got time to do some things, but there's always that competitive tension that means that you can't just rest on your laurels. So if there is a lot of discussion around returns. Fortunately, most reporting they look at five-year numbers which is a good thing rather than I mean, they, they show one and five years but they try not to focus too much on the short term I think that's that's a positive thing but there are other aspects around what you offer beyond returns that also make a difference so in our case insurance is really important because our members are in a quite dangerous industry and so we make sure that we have insurance that covers those members, whereas often when you do group insurance, they exclude people that work in dangerous industries. So, so tailoring product is also quite important. And brand is really important too. So You've got professionals who are doing property development to probably global external money managers. How do you spend your time? I've got to ask this question, you know, what do I do? And then, so often CIOs are sort of, pictured as the people that make the key investment decisions on different things and I do get involved in a lot of that but particularly over the last two years a lot of my time has been really around building an organizational structure thinking about the people building management capability within these technical team leaders because if you think about it investing is all about the people you got there and the decisions that they make and how they can make those decisions in the best way so I'm lucky that within our structure, we have sort of an embedded business partner in relation to people and culture. Uh, I've also got embedded team members around communications and media and so forth, which is important because if we want to pursue identifying, creating, sourcing our own opportunities, you sort of need to make it known to everyone that this is what you're doing. 
We've also got a legal team, compliance and so forth. All the things that you need, all the different pieces that when they come together are required to make things happen. I've also got a, um, it's a strategy team in a sense. It's not asset allocation, but it's sort of people have got management consulting backgrounds that sort of come in to say, well, how do we actually think about the team as a whole and, and bring together all these individual ideas into something that's quite coherent? So we develop quite a comprehensive an annually update strategy document. And this is not about thinking about the investment markets. This is thinking about, well, how are we going to position our team resources and effort over the next one, two, and three years? And we get out all of our team leads involved and we get them all on the same page around that. And again, I think that's pretty important. The interesting thing is for investment people that like numbers, the best way you can engage them on people is to actually create some measurable things around their activities. So we have engagement scores based on surveys, which are numbers, and we use that as a way of talking about well, what's their management style, what are your team asking for, and then we put programs in place that they support. We make it clear that we're addressing these things, and then you can see how the numbers change the next time around. And for those people, once they sort of see, well, actually, okay, I'm getting feedback early. I've got a mechanism to address it from a team point of view. I'm getting positive feedback back, but also I'm just seeing that the team's working better. A fundamental process that we've been trying to put in place, which is, again, all aligned with getting people to think about the team, not just about their individual self. When you have conversations with external money managers, many of whom are devoid of these types of long-term patient personnel development practices, how do you judge those managers when they don't have the same disciplines that you do in place to improve the team? A lot of them do. So part of what we've done is actually talk about how do you manage a pipeline of people and bring people through and create opportunity because they have risks, right? They have key person star risks that happen. So I wouldn't suggest that that is necessarily the case with everyone. Certainly fund managers that um, are very short term in terms of the way they think about people, we just don't think that their business model will sustain, right? Because the people are not aligned to us, they're aligned to themselves and it's likely that those people will be just attracted to move to another place anyway. When we evaluate managers, we do, particularly smaller teams, we actually spend a fair bit of time analysing the team and the dynamics. And that forms some of our judgement around whether we feel comfortable allocating money. Uh, I think that's fair to, it's a fair point. If we think truly believe that the way we think about people and how we align them and how they work together adds value, which we do. We apply the same sort of principles when we evaluate external fund managers. And what happens when the internal piece, meaning the way that someone's interacting with other members of the team is very positive, but the investment results aren't there? Ultimately, we need to look at whether it's a skills issue, whether the strategy is the wrong one. And in the same way that we do with fund managers, we'll have to address that. And I think people understand that. They understand that they're, they're given time, but ultimately we're there to drive performance. And not everyone sort of works out, so we have those discussions all in the way as well. But if you weren't willing to do that, then what are you sort of left with? It's really interesting. I mean, a typical trustee office, it's very easy to outsource because when anything goes wrong you blame the outsourcing not necessarily your decision and you can do that for a while until maybe a decade goes <laughs> they complain, oh, that's enough. but i don't know i think if you're closer to things i think you can react a little bit more nimbly to be honest my expectation is if i'm not able to deliver the outcomes but also the way that i deliver it, if it's inappropriate then i expect that CEO or the board will make a decision on whether I'm succeeding. They pay us. It may not seem like the same amount of money as fund managers, but they still pay us a lot of money, particularly when you think about what our members earn. So we have to manage the team in the same way and people need to be accountable for outcomes. What's the time horizon or duration that you think about for this investment pool? Well, it depends on what it is. So property could be 
more than the life of a property could be you hold it then you redevelop it infrastructure it's often between 20 and 40 years so you, you don't know what's going to happen in 20 years but you start to think about what could disrupt an asset when we think about a toll road or something like that we think about well what's the impact of automation and is there likely to be rail other 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 sort of alternative means of transportation when we think about property it's interesting it's what i like about these real assets it actually gives you a bit of a window on some of the secular changes that are going on in society so we look at our property developments in the residential space we're now thinking about making sure we have three-phase power in the car parks because the lead time between the design and when people are coming in is like four years and then they expect to be there for more than a decade. Well, at that time horizon, I think cars and that will change quite materially. But other interesting things is that, uh, you know, we have to think about the pumping systems for our property because higher incidence of flood and things like that, making sure that they're robust enough in the reception type areas we have to think about storage now because there's this huge trend where people are purchasing more and more online and getting things delivered so you can take that sort of property element and you can start to go well actually well how does it make us think about the broader portfolio there's a strong thematic in the way we look at these things and we do have to think beyond the immediate and try and understand what may or may not happen you can't plan for everything because this may happen very differently, but then you sort of go, okay, well, what's the process in the management of the asset that will allow us to adjust the asset to the things that occur over the next you know, five, 10 years? Yeah. And are you able to take a longer than normal duration in the public market investments as well? Yes. So our intention is to have lower turnover. It won't be zero because you know, there may be times that companies, they just get too expensive. Um, so we are aware of valuation. So one of our strategies that we're likely to introduce this year is to actually take more concentrated individual positions in some Australian listed companies with a view to not only just have those positions as an equity holder, but to look at whether we can be a provider of capital in other areas, so underwrite issuances or you know, look at corporate debt. And you can only really do that if you... First of all, you have a good understanding of the business, are willing to be a lot more patient, not move in and out, and have a bit of flexibility to say, okay, well, look, you know, we can actually invest in many different ways. It could be that they've got a physical asset in their business that they might want to expand, but they don't want to do it on balance sheets. So we could you know, do that in conjunction with them. And we think that by building those longer term relationships, we th that will give us investment opportunities and therefore opportunities to make returns on a better risk adjusted basis that I think is pretty hard for a fund manager to do. How do you think about hedge funds? So we have uh, and are going to pursue us of a more of a systematic risk premium harvesting type strategy. So I think that some of the elements of what their active strategies do provide diversification but that could be replicated in a lower cost way there are some really smart and well-resourced hedge fund managers that i would just die to have like one tenth one hundredth of the sort of resources and information that they have and clearly that does give some of them an edge but the fees are so high relative to the returns you know i do feel that there's only a very small handful i i believe that really earn those and that it's very easy for everyone else to come up and have the same fee scale and, and not really deliver that value. It's the same sort of issue with private equity as well. I mean, there's some really great private equity operators here, but everyone else seems to charge very similar fees. So it's an industry where you're promising something in the future, but you're charging and agreeing to charge something now. And the best hedge funds tend to be oversubscribed. You can't get into them unless you work really hard and identify the relationships early. And all the others are not are unlikely to be worth it. So for us, is, is, that, is that the area we're going to spend most of our effort or do we think that we're going to, to create value in different ways? So I think they have a place, definitely. I think there's probably many that don't deserve to be there. For us, it's probably an area where it's lower priority for us to pursue uh, because we 
have these other strategies that we think that we can pursue. So if you look 15 or 20 years out, what do you think the CBUS portfolio looks like? If you think about what investment banks do, I mean, they're really smart people. They're able to take ideas, pull them together and make them investable. Then they sell it on and make a lot of money from it. So we sort of want to have the capabilities of like an investment bank, but with the intent and heart and soul of what we have today. I think that would be a very powerful proposition. Well, let's turn to a few closing questions. What's your biggest investment pet peeve? You would have heard me talk about this a bit. I think the industry itself, I mean, the, it just astounds me that asset management industry can make 40% margin on their revenue. I mean, there's not many industries that sustain that. So for me, I think this distance between the beneficiaries and where the money actually goes and how that distorts decision-making makes you think very narrowly is something that I'd like to see the industry address and change. What's the riskiest thing you've ever done? When I learned to ski, my brother had taken up snowboarding and he encouraged me to come along with him. So the riskiest thing I did was actually just follow him around to the different sort of <laughs> slopes. He was taking me on black slopes and everything, and I would never have done that in my own right. I think there was a couple of occasions where trees got a little close to comfort. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but fortunately, I hadn't injured anything, although I think I came close. One of the things that's quite interesting, though, for that is that when you ski, I mean, you talk to snowplow. You can't snowplow down a steep slope. You actually have to go with purpose and intent. I think probably the same could be said around sort of the way that we're thinking about how we're changing our investment approach. I think sort of in a trusty environment, it's very easy to sort of snowplow and be cautious. But I think the real gains are take more of a risk, but you do have to do it seriously. You have to know the risks and know how to what you're in for but you have to go in with good, strong intent. Great analogy. What teaching from your parents has most stayed with you? My dad was an engineer, as I, I mentioned before. It's quite funny. He'd come back and he'd talk about these hospital projects and co-generation and even you know, you know, the early days of mobile phones and things like that. And he set up his own business because you know, he wanted to make a name there. And I think for me, that example of really... You know, not just doing the same old stuff, but being inquisitive about what some of these newer things are has been quite impactful. So for me, do what you do well, but actually look for the next opportunity is there. For my mum, she got married early, hadn't finished high school, but went back and did her high school certificate. She set up her own small business when we were young. What I've realised since then is like these things are very challenging for her, like getting out there, talking to people and so forth. It's actually quite challenging. When I reflect on what she did, I thought that's amazing. So from that, I think if you've got something, a good idea, don't be afraid to put yourself in a bit of an uncomfortable position to actually pursue it is what I got from her. What information do you read that you get a lot out of that other people might not know about? One of the things that's quite interesting about our board is that our chair is the ex-premier of Victoria, which is like the governor of the state. And there was a book that was produced on his time as premier of Victoria called uh, Catch and Kill. And the interesting thing is that when he got into parliament, it wasn't expected. There was a, there'd been a long period of fiscal consolidation and responsibility from the conservative side. And he was from the slightly like equivalent of the Democrats, the Labor side. And they only just got in. He had to negotiate a, a minority government. And the book walks through how he took that new government and worked with very many different people to create a vision around well, how are they going to actually make a change and do things differently and invest in back into the state, which had been obviously not invested in for a period of time because you know, the, the state balance sheet didn't allow that. And I think one of the things that's just really, I found, you know, it's, it's really fascinating because when I sort of think about well, how am I going to approach my board around something I want to do, knowing that you've got, the chair of the board has sort of done that on a state basis and, and is actually receptive to ideas and 
pursuing something a bit different. But having a very clear purpose around what you're trying to achieve has been very helpful. But I think from that, if you're in management, you're working with boards, I think getting a good understanding around some of the history that your directors have with them and therefore how that sort of shapes the way they look at the world and look at what you put forward is, I think, a really important thing. Yeah, yeah, great. All right, Christian, last one. What life lesson have you learned that you wish you knew a lot earlier in life? Okay, so as an actuary, you're all about numbers, you're all about facts and figures, and you know that you can do that. So I think when you first start your career, you think about yourself and your own capabilities and proving yourself. You almost think of it as like a competition. I have come to appreciate the way to succeed is not just by, I mean, you need to make a contribution and you need to understand what your capabilities are, but you're going to succeed far more with others than just by trying to do it all yourself. And that includes being willing to admit you're wrong or that you don't know something or to to be challenged, to be open to challenge. And so I was, particularly in more recent times, that's something I've learned that's very valuable. And it's taken me a while to sort of understand that and understand the power of that. And had I known that a bit earlier, I think I'd, I probably would have been able to do a lot more and I would have learned a lot more. Well, Christian, thanks so much for taking the time. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Hey, before you take off, I've started sending out a monthly email that shares a small selection of what caught my eye over the month. I get a lot of emails like this, and I'm sure you do too, so I'm only going to send no more than a handful of the very best things that caught my eye. If you'd like to receive that email, hop on my website at capitalallocatorspodcast.com and join the mailing list.